All right, you guys, I think we will get started. Um, I expect more, okay, I'll more folks to kind of trickle in as they free up from traffic. Yeah, um, yeah you're covered. So we're going to have a little bit of an agenda flip um, this morning. We'll do, I think, introductions maybe after Gordon's uh, presentation. Uh, we have a little bit of a scheduling change. Uh, we have a very busy man who has a flight to catch today. And then, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> to the next to the next. So, no, we appreciate you being here. Um, so, we'll get this, this first up going on uh, race and equity. Um, you know, when we, when we plan these workshops, we do it in like July, uh, and we kind of gauge the interest of what cities are saying that they want to hear, uh, and then what our partners are, are offering um, as well, and sort of come up with the workshop topics. By that, and a couple of things that you know I was not thinking about in July was that we would hold our April workshop in January. Um, so <laughs> I think that you know snow and ice has been a little bit of a barrier for folks this morning. Uh, and then the other one, kind of a little bit more seriously, is uh, today is the 50th anniversary of uh, the shooting of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and I wasn't thinking about April 4th uh, in kind of that context when we set this up, and so. Part of me feels like a little bit of a jerk for not thinking about that, and part of me really appreciates kind of the serendipitous nature of, of us having this workshop on this day. Um, and it's also Maya Angelou's would be 90th birthday today. Um, so mm -hmm. take a moment today and reflect on, on those two individuals and the impact that they've had um, on our history. Uh, so with that, first up we have Gordon Goodwin, who will be speaking about um, the, the GARE program, uh, and I'm just I'm gonna I'm gonna let you introduce yourself. And sure. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, good morning. How's everybody doing? Oh, great. All right. Good to see you all here as we were sort of fighting away on various roads to get here. Uh, and this morning for those who are remote or uh, looking at this from your computer. My name is Gordon Goodwin, and I'm with the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. Um, we're going to talk today about racial equity, and I'm going to be presenting to you just several core concepts about race and equity uh, that we use in our training work. And one thing that we'll just start with just quickly is just a little bit of reflection on these questions. Um, so in your daily life, how do the topic of race surfaces uh, in your discussions with friends, and family, people that you work with, and how are you experiencing those encounters? So, Give folks just a moment to think about that. I'll just ask a few questions about that. Good. You know, it's a very intense discussion, and I'd say has been for three, four years at our church. So it's a Unitarian. Universalist Church, a very old church in Minneapolis, and um, it's a, yeah, I'd say it's a theme, it's a, it's a sort of increasingly big theme that really occupies us. Yeah, yeah, that's good. It certainly has been something that usually, and it's been hard to escape as a topic, right, over the past couple of years. Other observations? Sure. Um, Peter Lindstrom, mayor of the city of Falcon Heights. Oh, hi. So, hi, good, yeah, good to see you. Right. I've heard your name a million oh, times. Okay. And it's great I'm glad to get to meet. I actually participated in uh, one or two of the Falcon Heights sessions that took place, just sort of around uh, community. Yeah, excellent. Um, so it's been almost almost two years, which is hard to believe, since Philando Castile was shot and killed yeah. um, in my community. And so I've been living and breathing. You know how it's impacted myself, my neighbors, uh, the entire community for a year and a half, two years now. Yeah, it's certainly been one heck of a journey, and there have been a good deal of reflection uh, amongst the public and law enforcement. There have been changes made uh, just in terms of how other jurisdictions are even thinking about traffic stuff. So we were doing some work about two weeks ago, uh, and we met out in Rose, uh, Roseville, and Roseville uh, made a decision 
not to want after Philando Castillo shooting that stopping drivers for equipment failures wasn't really related to having any measurable decreases in how public safety was going to be. So equipment stops are no longer being done. They started actually tracking the race of drivers that they were pulling over for infractions. We just released that data just this past uh, year. And some of you are probably aware that the city of St. Paul collected uh, information or data on the race of a driver for the past 15 years, which they released on their website just this past year as well. So it's really about getting information about a practice and disaggregating that by race so we can have some understanding about whether or not there's a disparate impact uh, experience. By the way, Rose, Roseville also uh, sends a survey to everybody who's been pulled over. Uh, when, when about a week or two after they are pulled over, they get a survey that asks them about, um, how, you know, where they did they feel like they were treated with respect um, during the pullover, and when they do observe equipment violations, they give out a certificate that the person can take to uh, an auto body shop mm -hmm. um, to have that light or whatever it is uh, replaced, which is kind of neat. That's Fixed right. for no charge or for limited uh, charge. Yeah. That's great right because it's an awareness uh, that not everybody is similarly situated in terms of making a repair. It can be expensive. Uh, you may not know where to go, right? Other things that you're coming across. Yes. My niece, uh, her brother's from Mexico, and so, and she's 15, so we've had a lot of conversations where she's angry about Black Lives Matter. What about brown lives? Why is it always black people? Uh, and then I also have a friend who's uh, white and he, it's funny how they echo each other sometimes where, you know, why is it always about black people? And people have the same complaint from two different perspectives and so we're having a lot of conversations about that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I mean there's certainly has been in terms of racially disparate treatment, the history of our country for black and brown people as well as people, you know, from the Asian diaspora has a, a lot of similarities. I think perhaps with African Americans, uh, slavery, as well as the fact that uh, you know, a lot of times when things come into strong repair around policing and housing discrimination in other areas, seems to be perhaps more intense around black people, at least in terms of the report. That's usually what I'm telling them, and then they're kind of pushing back. So it's right. Them. right, right. <laughs> Other ways this is showing up in your lives and your work. It's great sharing. Yes. Yeah. Maybe that was just somebody just put in something. Else. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. Um, so um, my daughter, she just recently graduated college, but during college, it was so top of mind and top of campus um, discussions about systemic oppression and. Um, all related issues that um, came up with it in, in ways that um, when I was in school or at other places in my life, and so that really raised a lot of conversation. And uh, I also wanted to mention I was just in Los Angeles the weekend before I left and walked into Los Angeles County University, uh, the Resnick Gallery, and then right in the very entrance new art installation about Philando Castile. Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, it's so, I mean, it's not beautiful to look at, but it's, um, it's all the words um, that his girlfriend was recording on the video, and it's, it's just so powerful. Is that the LACMA? Uh, LACMA? Is that the Muslim of art in the world? Are there any comments? Thank you very much yeah. for sharing that. Uh, are there any comments because uh, in particular just the understanding about the systemic nature of racism and race we'll talk just a little bit about that in terms of some of the definitions that we use that are foundational around that any comments from some of the folks who are not with us here in the room today maybe here online not that i see at the moment okay. All right. i'll let you know <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you. Feel free to toss those out there at any time. Yeah, we can use um, the, the the question and answer box or the chat box 
to enter your questions or comments. Thank you for indulging me with these questions. Um, it's always interesting when those questions pop up to see sort of the initial light or a fight sort of response that people have around. Them. And that's for all many times, right? Because we often don't talk about this in our society, sometimes because people think it's impolite, sometimes because we think that uh, even talking about race may put us into a situation where we're having a very different conversation with somebody about uh, what the dynamics of race are about. We may say something that might be uninformed or taken in the wrong way. We end up saying something that might be construed as racist and being called a racist, which we understand societally, right? Is right underneath being called child molester. <laughs> really, it is. Just, I mean, it's, it's just in terms of the, so, the social stigma. So the fact of the matter is, you know, policing has certainly been one of the areas that's been in really strong focus, largely because, well, let me just ask you this, has the uh, incidence of reporting of police misconduct uh, against unarmed, um, unarmed people, uh, black people, has that gone up over time? Has it stayed the same? your understanding of that? Assume, assume it's up. You assume it's up. At right. least in the media. At least in the media, right? Least, yeah. Okay. You take a look at the statistics. Over time, it has remained relatively the same, right? What has changed that dynamic is that all of us have a CPU with a camera on it that doubles as a phone right in our pocket most of the time. And some of the good things about that, you know, from the perspective of people in communities of color who have known that these things have been happening is that, you know, people would talk about it, but nobody ever really sort of saw it enough to actually show the rest of the world, here's how these things can happen. But now we're all aware that these things can happen, and it's shocking when we see them. But that's one level of discussion at the explicit and institutional you see those things happening and they, they really are controversial and they're extremely emotional and they create a space where you sort of enter into that conversation. There's also really talking about the institutional and And these are policies and practices and procedures that work very well for white people, don't work very well for communities of color or for immigrants. And it's often inadvertent. Uh, but when you take a look at the outcomes, it's no less damage, right? So that's where we really focus a lot of our work with GEAR. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, just so that you have a context for that and what we're doing here in Minnesota. We're a national movement as well as uh, a membership organization. Uh, GEAR stands uh, for Government Alliance on Race and Equity. There are Actually, this number here where it says 55, at last count, we were closer to 83, which is where we keep adding new members. Uh, we are having our membership meeting, annual membership meeting, next week in Chicago. That's where I'll be heading on Saturday to prepare for that. And that will have about 300 participants from across the country. Uh, if you will, a sense as to where those folks are coming from. I know this is a little bit hard to see. I'm hoping this is a laser pointer. Good. So Minnesota, <laughs> you can be proud of as having been one of the places that really adopted the GARES approach early on. Starting in 2014-2013, Julie Nelson, who had been the Race and Equity Director for the City of Seattle, was coming here working with the city of Minneapolis, working with the city of St. Paul, with Hennepin County and with Ramsey County, and really introducing them to the racial equity tools. And that really began to build up some momentum. Over the past couple of years, you know, we've, uh, you can see that we've gotten outside of the Metro Mankato to participate in. We've actually had, uh, well, let's see, uh, Red Wing participated uh, about a, a year or two ago. Uh, we've also, I'm thinking about Northfield, is currently participating. 
So we're starting to branch out beyond the immediate metro and involve jurisdictions that are not, you know, right here in sort of a seven county metro area and are really uh, starting to get engaged and involved in having not just conversations about race, but trying to figure out how they can actually do something to have an impact. Uh, some of you may know, and Kevin will probably talk about this, but Kevin and I had a recent trip in January down to Pipestone, Minnesota. Uh, Pipestone is a community probably about 95% white. However, the school district ranks K through 8, 50% children of color, right? Latino, Black, American Indian. And that's somewhat of a bellwether for that community. It's also a big change for that community. It's going to probably dictate what the community looks like, maybe 20, 30 years down the road. Uh, just up the road from there, uh, you know, there are several other communities. I'm skipping my mind at the moment, but um, Marshall, for instance, Marshall, and then further on up, what was the one that you were thinking of? Worthington. Worthington, exactly. Worthington is 38, 39%. Right? So, Greater Minnesota is changing as well. But you can also see that we're doing work in California. There are three cohorts there, one for the very northern part of the state, Sacramento, the Bay Area, and then the Valley Area. And you can see we've got activity all over the country. And that is because there are jurisdictions who are realizing that having a conversation about race is one thing, but how we actually get to outcomes means that we're going to have to figure out what we're doing that's getting in the way of us serving everyone in the communities uh, that we're supposed to serve. The learning cohorts are really based around national best practice. And so what that means is normalizing conversations about race. So that pop question that I had at the beginning of our discussion is really sort of where people enter into the discussion about this. And it's important that we acknowledge that when things happen in our society that are unjust or are wrong or are racially insensitive, that we do have that discussion. It's also important that we realize that you know, we're not going to be able to control people's behavior all the time in terms of what they think. But within institutional settings, we can actually begin to control how they behave if we're taking a look at the practices, which are usually not written down, and the procedures which govern how people are thinking about and doing their work. And we'll talk just a little bit more about that. Um, operationalizing is really around the racial equity tools. So where do we begin to interrupt some of these processes that work really well for getting the efficiencies that we want within government, but like many hiring practices, may go through channels that are very traditional, that may not be very connected to communities of color or to immigrant communities. When we think about uh, advancement, we think about how, and I'm just using workplace equity as one of the examples, you know, the city of Philadelphia and I also believe Minneapolis Parks and Rec Board have been taking a look at people who are in their seasonal and in their temporary employee pool, folks who generally had not been considered for long-term employment, some of whom in the city of Philadelphia, they found a gentleman who had been a temporary employee for 22 years, um, hadn't really been thought of as being you know, someone who might actually be interested or qualified you know, to take on a full-time role with Parks and Rec. Um, if you'd like to know more about some of the work that we do with Parks and Recreation, there's, uh, which is a huge field, right, in terms of how public services are delivered to the public, we have some of that information on our website. Uh, but these are the ways that people are starting to think differently about how they've been getting to solutions and really taking a look at what their outcomes are. Uh, to help guide them to you know, some understanding about what they need to do differently. The organizing piece is really about what we do internally inside our organizations and institutions. How we begin to have this conversation 
so that we understand why we need to be doing this work in the first place. The visualized piece is really where I think public, publicly elected officials can be very helpful for us, is that if you all are not talking about why we need to acknowledge that race is one of the factors that really determines how well we do in our society, then other people are definitely not going to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so there's, you're really standing in the place of the public. Uh, so that recognition that you know race is a factor uh, is one of the things that we ask public officials just to acknowledge. Um, it doesn't mean that you know you necessarily have to make apologies about things, but it does mean that people are beginning to understand that the way things are is not because we are fundamentally different, right, at the level of our chromosomes or uh, what makes us human. It's really about the structures that have been put in place to create an equity. In terms of What's happening right now in Minnesota? Uh, when I came in the room, somebody asked me about you know, how to become sort of part of the GEAR learning year. We are almost in the middle of the GEAR learning year for 2018. There are two cohorts, an introductory cohort. These are the jurisdictions that are involved. In, uh, Metropolitan Council is actually this is their second introductory cohort uh, team that they have. Um, as well as uh, I believe Hennepin County Library and Minneapolis Parks and Rec. For the implementation cohort, you can see the folks who are engaged and involved in actually working on a racial equity action plan. And that's a set of priorities uh, that they have developed uh, for how they're going to do their work. So for the introductory cohort, there's a curriculum that we have, which is really all about the normalizing aspect of the work and the racial equity tool. Um, this is where we spend a fair amount of time early on identifying opportunities to use a racial equity analysis. And the way we talk with employees about it on core teams is that, and what does an opportunity mean, right? So it's usually something that's within your realm of responsibility. It's usually a day-to-day -day function that you're carrying out. Could be catering, you know, for a meeting like this. It might have to do with how you're doing your next hiring process. It might have to do with how you're actually carrying out your comprehensive planning. So we did some work with the Met Council last year, but they recently received an award about from the American Planning Association. That work was a series of four sessions, complimentary sessions. Uh, did anybody attend any of the planet sessions with uh, Met Council? No planners here in the room, that's okay. Uh, but it was a four part series. And what we really focused on is at certain inflection points having to do with water and with other essential services, with emergency services, with resiliency um, and uh, with transportation, housing, where do we begin to incorporate a racial equity analysis in ways that begin to open up uh, new opportunities to provide better service to everyone, right? By focusing on communities of color who are typically not thought of when we're doing that. A racial equity action plan is really how the rest of the year is structured. Uh, each of the jurisdictions leads with a racial equity action plan, and then they have the opportunity to implement that. And that's why we have the implementation plan. So we've talked about this a little bit, but if you take a look at any measure, any measure of success in American society, take a look at it from a you know, health perspective, take a look at it from a family, um, household income perspective, um, you know, educational attainment. Um, some people like to talk about social mobility, right? Race plays a significant role in how well you do in our society and how those measures begin to play out. So when we start, even if we talk about economic inequality, we start taking a look at the data. Oops. 
doing this bad. And it's starting to get the button there. When we start taking a look at the data around criminal justice, when we start taking a look at the data around jobs and housing, and you start really disaggregating that by race, that's where you see where burdens occur, right? In terms of communities of color and access. And so if that's the case, then one of the things we need to ask our question about is how did it get there, right? Why did this happen? Is this naturally occurring or is this occurring because of some other factor? And when we take a look at the role of government, there are some key things to keep in mind. So government is supposed to be there to serve all. It's supposed to be of the people, by the people, for the people, right? So really supposed to be a utility accessible to all. One of the things we need to acknowledge is that since before the country was a country, there have been laws that government has enforced that have created the inequities that we have. So we've had laws that have determined citizens who could vote, who could own property, who could be property, uh, rules about who you could marry, where you could live, whether you could read or write, laws about whether or not your government service in the military would be honored and recognized, significant amounts of laws over most of the course of the history of the country that have created the racial inequities that we're experiencing today. So you know, this particular poster is one of the reflections of that. This is about the Dawes Act. And I use this because the initial sort of experience of law and segregation, as well as separating people from resources is with the Indian nation, right? Within over 500 treaties that have been broken. Um, the Dawes Act was really about another solution for Indian people, where it was decided they should be farmers. So we will allot them about 140 acres per family to do farming, not even recognizing the fact that many of the tribes we're not participating in agriculture, right? We're going to give you 140 acres, not connect you to any resources like farm credits to actually do the farm uh, or other knowledge bases. And then, because you're a significantly smaller population and we've apportioned that land to you, the extra land that is your land in the treaty, we're going to sell. We're going to sell it for white settlers. And that's part of the expansion of the West and the Plains took place, right? And so there are so many other aspects to history uh, that we could focus on about this. You take a look at what took place with the Social Security Act. Social Security Act was a significant advancement for our society. But at the time that the Social Security Act was passed, there were two, uh, two professions that were left out. Anybody know what those were? Domestics, right? right? Railway? <laughs> Not railway. Railway people actually they did well. Right. Oh, that's what they did. Right. It's another service industry that we all rely on at least three times a day. Like janitorial. Food. Food. Exactly. Uh, food. Right. Thank you very much. Right. So, hmm. you know, anybody who's working as a farm worker, not included. Right? And we actually had to change the act. So that it did cover those professions. Now let's think about this for a minute. When you think about domestic workers, large numbers of women of color doing that, also large numbers of white women doing that work too, right? So we bring that up just to focus on the fact that when you do focus on communities of color, there is overlap, right, with white people. And so redressing that actually created more opportunity for more white families to participate in Social Security as well. And I'm sure everyone here is now aware that there's been a project in the Twin Cities that's been focusing on what's occurred with FHA. I used to believe, you know, trained as a planner, that banks had actually adapted the redlining piece. 
They adopted it because that was part of the standard for FHA. FHA was the principal purchaser of mortgages. Prior to, you know, the 1929 or thereabouts, when we wanted to buy a home, they had to pay 50% of the cost up front. You maybe got seven to nine years to pay it off. That's how you own property, right? After that, you have a standard 15 to 30 year mortgage, relatively low rates. Unless, of course, you're a person of color and you can't get a loan because be part of the underwriting standard that the government set says that for neighborhoods where there is even one black family, that's a risk for future default. That's a risk for how these loans are going to be repaid. I know, I see it in your face, right? It's hard to believe that, that could actually be written into it, but you know, let's take a look at the redlining maps and the rationale that went into that. And you can see that redlining was generally, you know, you're approaching 20 to 30 percent people of color in a neighborhood. Um, and, they, and, and actually, that was sort of sometimes more dangerous in the eyes of the underwriters than a neighborhood that might already be at 50 percent uh, because it, it seemed to suggest them impending risk on investments that had already been made. Green was usually for all white people. When you take a look at those maps and you start overlaying them on where we have racial segregation here in the Twin Cities, it's a tremendous amount of overlap. So it's a significant impact. So here's a couple of concepts that we talk about in our work um, that are fairly foundational for how we talk about equity. So Equity and equality, what's the difference? We tend to use them as the same word, but they really do mean different things. And we actually use the experience of going to the restroom as a way to bring that into relief. So let's say you're at the state fair, or you are at uh, some other crowded event, and there's 51% of the population that's women, 49% that are men. By law, in Minnesota, we have to have equal accommodations for both genders, right? right? But for women, how is your experience different <laughs> under those circumstances? It's exactly the same, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Longer, lines. longer lines, right? How much longer would you say? Three, four, five times. Three, four times? Okay. I was in, uh, when I was in San Jose yesterday, it was 10 times longer is what the guesstimate was on that. It's significantly longer, right? So if you think about, you know, stalls as a resource, usually when we're talking about equality, we're talking about resources and resource allocation. But when you're thinking about equity, it's really about the experience, right, of actually accessing that basic function that we all need to do. What are some of the ways that we're addressing that challenge? How are we shortening the line for women? Some women have just taken that into their own hands and they're like, well, forget it, I'm using the men's room. <laughs> There's that, right? That's happening, right? Other things that you're seeing in sort of how public accommodations are addressed? More stalls. Right, I mean, you know, the People Stadium, right? is one of the examples of that, um, where they actually did put in more stalls. And that's probably going to have a significant impact on other public structures. Other things that you see. Gender-neutral restrooms. Gender-neutral restrooms. Anybody seen a family restroom? Another way, right? So has anybody had the experience of seeing a double-loaded restroom, one side for men and one side for women, actually have the sign set so that it's all just that's happening in some places as well. So all of that to address the length of that line. Now, is one of the ways to do that to make the line longer for men? No, it isn't, right? <laughs> so, so making the experience worse for everybody is not part of the solution. 
But let me ask uh, men, so are you in any way disadvantaged when you're waiting for the women in your lives to party to wait three to four times and sometimes longer than the restroom? Thank yeah. you for saying yes, right? Yeah. You, you know, like, we're all waiting, right? Uh, you might be waiting with, you know, small children who are in attendance, uh, elders my age, that's what, you know, yeah. we're waiting with and for. And it can be inconvenient to everybody. So coming up with a solution to this actually creates a better experience for all of us, right? But let me ask you this. If we didn't focus on gender, would we be able to get the solution? Or at least the way we gender assign the rest of the mm -hmm. Probably not. However, just keep in mind that uh, gender non-conforming population is having us question why we even have gender assigned restrooms in the first place. Some of you who've traveled abroad have had an experience, like my experience in Marseille, where I go into a restroom and there are women coming out of the stalls and I'm thinking to myself, I, I'm surely in trouble now because my fridge is not that great. And here I am, you know, in the women's restroom. But no, that is the restroom, right, for everybody. So the other piece around this is that when we think about the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was really focused on a class of people who have are experiencing physical um, difficulties navigating in the same space that you and I navigate every day, there are accommodations that were made to them that we use every day. How many people have used the automatic door opener on a heavy door at a public building, right? <laughs> Maybe have your hand. How many people use uh, the cutaways in the sidewalk when you have a stroller or you have a roller car or even just your baggage, right? How many people use um, or like having door handles that aren't sort of some round metallic thing that when you have wet hands, you can't really even turn, right? And actually having a lever. Those came about through the ADA. The focus on the community that was most burdened actually creates the opportunity for all of us to be better safe. And so that's what the equity piece is, is how we actually accommodate um, communities of color who have been burdened by an equity in our society, and how by doing that, we also create a better society for everyone. Right? So that's a key piece to understand about that. Any, any questions? Yes. Um, maybe this is where you're going in, so I apologize if I'm interrupting you. Um, what are some of the arguments that when people are like, give me an example, how am I, a low-income white person, benefited by better things for communities of color you don't understand, I've suffered economically, I've had this conversation with someone, and I don't have the best, like, Retort. So I feel like a lot of times we hear that kind of promise of it benefits everyone, but sometimes I struggle with like how. So one of the things that we do, and this is actually a fairly common conversation in this right? Because uh, part of the Minnesota story is that there are people who came here, some of them tripped by the railroad, right? Uh, to come and live in crowded conditions, work for very low wages, uh, in camps where there was nothing but men, right? Um, and really taken advantage of. And that bootstrapping story, right? About my folks came here with nothing and they made something out of their lives is very strong, quite prevalent. There are other people who came here too. They did not have the force of law to prohibit them from participating in the economy, in owning land, right? So that's part of the challenge around that story. The other piece of it is around, you know, what happens when there are low-income white people who feel that they're experiencing um, changes in the economy, and then they also may feel some of that because they see they there's this whole sort of myth around other people aren't trying hard enough, right? To be part of the economy or to better themselves in their lives. The only way to really begin to address that is to start having some conversations with people 
about what is important to them for the children. What is it that they are facing in terms of the challenges that they have in their lives and where they see that there need to be some ways to build some bridges, right, to some opportunities. People of color want the same things, right? They really do. And so, so I'm thinking about perceptions of like more competition in jobs. Oh, as a white man, you know, nobody wants to hire a white man anymore. I, you know, I said that perception of like, well, actually, this racial equity stuff is detrimental to me personally as a white man. Oh, what's your answer to those kinds of things? My stock answer used to just be to show people the data, right? One of the challenges that we're facing in the world that we're living in the past two years has been what is true, what is safe. And what is it that people sort of get told that completely it goes against their frame about who is actually worse off? So if I can take a look at what our current economic statistics are and say, based upon what we're seeing in terms of the unemployment rate, there's never been a better time to find a job, but realize that the unemployment rate for blacks is still double what it is for whites, and for youth of color, sometimes triple what it is, right? For white youth, we can show people that data, whether or not they believe it, and what type of, uh, I guess, messages they assign to that about why that is the way it is, is part of the challenge that we're living. So part of the work that Race Forward does is around changing that narrative about why those things are the way they are. And it's, you know, having a conversation with somebody begins to bring out some of that, but don't think one conversation is going to do it, right? It is just not. So I don't want anybody here in this room to think that a chance, you know, encounter with someone who is deeply rooted in a belief structure that says that you know, they are being victimized by people of color is going to change their mind. I'll tell you though where I spend most of my time is with people who are, let's just say race equity agnostic, right? Folks who sort of say, well, I don't know. Give me a reason why I should care, right? Huh? Sorry. You asked me. <laughs> and what I have found is that for the, let's say, 10, sometimes 12% of the population that may be deeply rooted in a belief structure that says that, you know, they're being victimized and that the people to blame are people of color. And let's just be real about this. We're living in a current debate right now about immigration. That is all about that. It is all about that, right? There are a lot of other people who look at these things and are wondering and trying to figure it out, does this make sense? Aren't we a country of immigrants? And what's actually happening? They're open to having a conversation that is influenced by data. And, you know, there are things like uh, some of the stories uh, that are in A Good Time for the Truth, for instance, which begin to attach a narrative to that data so that it really becomes real. Part of the challenge of having this conversation in our society is that many of us don't know people of color, right? Now, one of the things, I just have to say this, it's just something that I found to be true. If you're going to be a professional in a society and a person of color, you are going to know some white people, all right? You're going to know some white people. However, it seems to be the case that you can get through our society, and in many cases, as a white professional, not have to know any people of color. Why is that? Why is that the way? So what that means is that our churches, other civic spaces, become these places where we need to be able to take some risks. One of the things that halts this conversation from going any further is, where is the forum? where we actually begin to have this discussion and have it be about our shared history, right, of having 
government have explicit laws that created the separation that we have, and how we're still living with that. Because it's not taught in our history books, guys. I gotta tell you, we had time to take a look at um, uh, is it, uh, race, the power of an illusion. Then we would be all sitting there saying, "How come I didn't know? <laughs> How come I didn't know this?" But that's, I think, part of the challenge of how our history is also part of a legacy, right? And that legacy does not like to acknowledge some of the very painful things that have happened in our country and are still being perpetuated. So, let's go with um, just this piece here. When we're talking about racial equity, what we're talking about is closing the gaps that exist between institutional structures and communities of color and reducing the barriers so that race doesn't play an outsized role in determining how well we do in our society. That's what we're talking about. But to do that, we've got to target those strategies on those communities that are most burdened. And so when we start taking a look at disparities, and you know, we have a fascination about disparities here in Minnesota, right? I mean, that's the, we have to realize those disparities are the end result Right? Those are the things that you see, the differences in mathematics and uh, reading, the differences in household income, they didn't just appear like that. They happen because there are a series of things that led up to this. If you want to begin to interrupt that, you've got to start taking a look at what happens upstream. And so targeting strategies to focus and movements for those who are worse off is part of the work that we're doing here, those racial equity tools, the services approach uh, for government, which is extremely important at times when we are all going to face challenges in our lives. Uh, we're not saying that uh, you should get rid of services. But services often deal with symptoms. You're not going to get at the root cause. So I'm going to stop there for a bit. I think this. This core definition around what racial equity is is extremely important. We've had me a bit more time. We've talked a little bit about bias and implicit, explicit bias. Uh, important thing to know the implicit piece is really around operating at the subconscious level individually. Um, and if anybody here listen to any of the uh, Hidden Brain series that occasionally you would hear. Sean Carpadonsum on uh, Minnesota Public Radio talked about that. Did you hear those? Mm -hmm. Well, suffice to say that sometimes we think we make up our own minds about this, right? We have a lot of deliberation about the choices we make. Not so much. <laughs> our subconscious plays a very significant role in the choices that we make. And it plays a very significant role in how we react to people uh, based upon their race. That very basic attraction and repulsion piece is something that's baked into us at a cultural level. And that can play out in institutions as well, right, in terms of how that has disparate impacts on communities of color. But the implicit nature of what we do with government is really having them understand what their data is showing about their outcomes versus you know, what they think their outcomes should be things were operating in a society where we had equality and fairness. And then really taking a look at where can we begin to interrupt that? Are there checklists we might use that help us understand better, you know, how we're making our decisions? Are there ways that we should start asking questions at critical points, such as who's not included in this conversation about, you know, how we're doing water quality? Uh, what communities are going to be more burdened by a particular decision, um, who actually uh, may be more advantaged in this particular case, how are the decisions that we're making actually contributing to a better result at the community level, and what data do we have? So any questions that you have? I mentioned Kevin Frizzell to you earlier, and Kevin and I talked about our, just a little bit about our trip to Pipestone. 
couple of things that are happening in Pipestone for school, like that. I think Kevin is going to talk with me about uh, the league's experience in working with Yeah, before we get into that, I guess, as you see sort of more cities and regional governments participating um, in this program, what do you kind of see as the trajectory of that and the impact of that um, in the Midwest? I'm glad you're asking that question. And it's actually going to be one of the sessions that is taking place at our meeting next <coughs> week. Uh, up to now, there have been about 30 jurisdictions, that is like cities or counties, and probably about 12 state departments that participate in this year. What's happening now is that because we have some early stage uh, jurisdictions that were involved, I mentioned to you that St. Paul and Minneapolis and Ramsey County and Hennepin County sort of were the first in, they have sort of passed that emergent stage of, hey, we've been working with these tools. They're now at the stage of, uh, really implementing their plans and trying to sustain them. In particular, in St. Paul, uh, they're now at the stage of sustaining because there's been a change in leadership, right? Same thing with me now. So I expect that what we'll see is, is what we have seen, more jurisdiction in the metro is starting to get involved. And a more concerted demand uh, by jurisdictions outside of the metro. Uh, to begin to get more interested in doing this work. And I think we're seeing that happen. Certainly saw it happen this last, uh, last go around, and I don't expect that that is going to change. Now, it's, uh, this may seem like a small thing, but one of our meetings is going to be taking place in Rochester on May 23rd. And so for this to be a traveling road show to go to Rochester, I think begins to send a message also that um, you know we'll be going outside of the metro to do some of our other meetings. And I'm hopeful that what that will mean is that people begin to uh, learn about gear from the jurisdictions that are participating, like Mankato and Red Wing and uh, others, and Rochester, and that they start saying, hey, you know, maybe we should be able to have a cohort here. Uh, we just finished a session, not Minnesota specific, but in Appleton, Wisconsin. The reason we did it in Appleton is because the folks who are in Dane County and Madison have been doing this work for a while, and they talk about the Madison effect of the work. Of, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Madison's doing it. Yeah. <laughs> what would you expect? That's why I say it, Berkeley's doing it. <laughs> and so, so they said, no, we're not going to do this. So, County. Let's do it in Apple. And people really thanked us. We had folks coming from Milwaukee, from a number of other jurisdictions. I would try to pronounce the names of some of them, but I'm not really familiar with the territory there. But I suspect that there is going to be a cohort that starts there. Largely because we didn't on Madison and Hey, Gordon. Sure. Um, a lot of the Communities participating in the cohorts are 20,000 population yeah. and above, mm -hmm. with some exceptions. Mm -hmm. What about those smaller towns? I, and I know it's there's a cost to participate. Yeah. I think it was at like 10 grand or something like that. Maybe not, maybe not I got that wrong. Not for most. Okay, <laughs> no, yeah. No, and, for but there, and there's a there's a big time commitment too. There right? is a significant time. Yeah. Commitment. So which is a challenge for those smaller communities. Have, have you thought about how do you're gonna tackle that with 850 plus cities in our state, the vast majority are 20,000 and below population. So I think I, we're I getting to Kevin's part of the program. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> because we have talked about it. And I, you know, here's the thing that I think needs to happen about that. If we follow our own principles about how we do our work, then I think that if we're able to work through the league to identify maybe something of a steering that could help us understand how we would do this, what would be useful. Um, there have been some jurisdictions that have told us how some of the uh, curriculum needs to be tailored to better suit their needs. Um, for instance, uh, one jurisdiction let us know, hey, you know, um, we don't have our own police department. We 
work with the Sheriff's Department. Uh, we have a fairly small team here uh, in our jurisdiction, so some of the aspects of organizational change are likely shortcut for us. It's like if there's four of us in the hallway, that might be five or six departments meeting. You know? So how do we sort of uh, adapt this model to our environment? And I think that there, my takeaway, I had some takeaways from that, but having a few more discussions about how we begin to adapt it, in, even in terms of the time commitment, right, mm -hmm. uh, I think is sort of the next level. All of this is happening, of course, at a time where fear has grown tremendously just over the past year. When I first came on as a staff person, there were 42 jurisdictions that year numbers. Last count was at 80, and um, the projects have also expanded as well. So I think we'll be looking for the league to be a key partner in helping us figure that out. But certainly, the league is aware that there are a significant number of jurisdictions, um, smaller populations, and then great. Kevin, is anything you want to add? I will when I get up. I'll sure. you know, answer, try to answer all those questions. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Just really quickly, Green Step Cities is focused on sustainability and environmental issues. Um, for those cities that might be wondering, why should we, as an environmental you know, sustainability program, be caring about race and equity when, when that can kind of be a separate? In a couple of sentences, are there some good talking points that we can give? First of all, let me just say that uh, when you take a look at your and you take a look at who participates, do you feel that that embraces a full spectrum of people in the community that you're working in? Are people of color involved? They are not. One of the reasons we have an environmental justice movement in this country is because people of color were left out environmental issues for such a long time they got so tired of it that they really created that to bring attention to the fact that they're most at risk. When we talk about resiliency, we're talking about communities of color who are positioned in areas where they're most uh, at harm, right, either from air pollutants, water quality, flooding, and have the least amount of resources and access and connection to government when disasters happen. So I guess what I would say is if you really care about environmental sustainability and you want that to be for all of your community, you may want to start asking yourself some questions about who's actually involved and engaged in that and who stands to benefit, who stands to lose, right, and how you begin to address that. Yes. We have a question from uh, Rick Morris from online. Sure. Uh, he says, is the GARE training and cohort work specifically and exclusively for city, county staff and board or council members? Or I guess is it for others as well? It's for so staff, yes, are involved. They actually are moving the work along at a very regular basis. We have, the League and GARE have done a, an elected leaders learning community over the past couple of years. It's really focused on the role of elected leadership. We have had elected leaders participate in the GARE sessions um, as part of the teams. What was the last category? Um, board or council members. I, yeah. I, I think it was kind of, I think if I'm understanding. Yeah. Um, they play roles sometimes that have been a little bit ancillary because commissions usually get their, you know, scope from uh, you know, a city council or county commission, right? Some of the like human rights commissions and things, but all of them have played a role usually when it comes to implementation. It's extremely helpful to have elected leadership be able to have a case statement about why this work is taking place in their jurisdiction because they have this public facing uh, opportunity to really um, advance that as part of why we have government in the first place. 
And so that's been very helpful. That doesn't always fit. Sometimes the work takes place, and very good work can take place, really with employees driving. We always love to have elected leaders and um, appointed and elected officials uh, be on board. And so now sure he also, yeah, he clarified, um, can community become involved, um, community organizations and individuals? They're actually fairly important to this. So the reason that they are is that when we talked about organizing a while back, there's an internal aspect to that, but there's also an external aspect. And working with community-based organizations and other community groups, like neighborhood organizations, to understand why this work is important and why you should allow it to continue uh, can be one of the things that helps it be successful. So I'll give you an example. Um, there are people, you know, neighborhood associations in particular, um, that tend to play out, you know, basically the way neighborhoods are arranged. Some of them are all white, some of them represent communities of color. Um, we've seen dynamics where there have been neighborhood associations that can ask the question, why are we wasting this money? You know, it's really care work. Why are we even talking about this? Like, this is enough that you fill the potholes and, you know, tend to the off bills and those other services. We don't really have race as an issue in our community. Why should we be doing this? And if we're not actually advancing a message about how this is not only beneficial to communities of color and immigrant communities that we're serving, but also creating benefits for everyone else uh, in terms of better service, then that can actually uh, be something that begins to do real. So yes, there's a role for them to play. Some jurisdictions are better at engaging with communities than others, and they don't have to do it on their own. There are some helpful organizations out there and some ways to begin to do this on a more consistent basis that gets away from, say, a public hearing, which is something you know, we know how to do a lot, or just a couple of you know, outreach meetings for input, but they never loop back to any type of uh, communication back to community-based entities to help, you under help them understand how you use their input. Really what this is about is accountability for results at the community level. By that, I mean some way that people in the community are better off. Any other questions I can answer? I'm nearing the end of my time, I don't want to impinge too much on Kevin's time. Just really quick, yeah. you mentioned it's a national organization. Clearly, there's a lot going on in Minnesota. Yeah. Are your um, how are the priorities geographically? Is it you know, like people talking about like, hey, there's tons of work to be done in Minnesota? Is it like, sorry, we really need to spend more of our time in other states? Or how is that? So we're divided into regions. Uh, I should have included a picture of the Midwest region. The bicycle is 12 states, okay? Uh, it stretches from the east all the way over to Ohio, comes back west towards Nebraska, uh, towards the north. Uh, Minnesota, Upper Michigan, and then towards the south, which is um, not Indianapolis, but uh, I'm sorry, Indiana. One other state. Missouri. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, Missouri. So that's a fairly broad region, and we're still growing as a staff. We're fairly responsive. The work here in Minnesota is my principal concern. Um, we are starting to branch out a little bit into Michigan, Iowa, and to Wisconsin. For the other states, I think they're you know, part of the region. Uh, responsiveness in those areas is going to have to take place after we're able to take care of things here in Minnesota. So we're trying to grow our staff and consulting tools to, to do that. And Illinois is probably going to End up so it's a dynamic tension. We're living in it. <laughs> so. I want to thank you very much uh, for your participation today. Thanks for uh, engaging with me on those first questions about race. And uh, 
look forward to speaking with you all in the future. And hopefully, you know, you'll, maybe some of you uh, will be participating in the Racial Equity Day or pre-conference that's taking place with uh, the Minnesota cities. I steal too much of that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you again, Gordon. We really appreciate you taking the time. And now, like, you're very busy with a large Midwest schedule. So, okay. great. Um, we did flip our schedule around a little bit, so we uh, skipped introductions in the beginning. Uh, so, I want to quick kind of go around the room and say who all is here, um, and then we'll, we'll transition to Kevin. Um, so, I'm Abby Finnis, uh, Show Director of the Great Institute Program, and I work at the Great Plains Institute. Um, and, uh, 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 Music, I work with Abby over at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency on Grid Center. Peter Lindstrom, Clean Energy Resource Teams, and also Mayor of Falcon Heights. Uh, Kristen Peterson, also at Great Plains Institute. And um, I took a poll online a little bit, a while ago, um, asking who is watching the workshop alone or with other people in the room. Um, most people are watching with just them and their computer, but um, one respondent had more than six people all together. Um, Kristen Moreau, I'm the local government coordinator with the Environmental Quality Board. My name is Cassandra Schuler. I'm the recycling coordinator for the cities of West St. Paul, South St. Paul, Mendota Heights, and Sunfish Lake. I'm Paige Albert, project manager with the Ramsey Washington Metro Watershed. My name is Alicia Sojourner, racial equity coordinator with the city of St. Louis Park. My name is Maggie Kozak. I work for Clean Energy Research Team, like you said. Ben Hafter, Laura Milberg, Pollution Control Agency. Kevin Frizzell, League of City Staff. Danielle Cabinet, Communication. Giuseppe Tonello, Minnesota Green Corps member with the Environmental Quality Board. Kevin Walsh from the City of St. Louis Park. So, Kevin Spindle is going to share a bit about um, the week he's been doing uh, with GARE. Uh, and then we'll just kind of open it up for any discussion. Um, I think originally we said we'd go two and a half hours, but due to scheduling, we're going to stick with the normal two hours. Um, if we finish up early, that's fine, but I think you know, we can probably take it through to a couple. Um, Kevin. Okay. Yeah, and Danielle. Yeah, Danielle, I'm going to join in too. She's also been a key leader here at the League Race Equity Work. So um, I have to let you know that I sort of got pulled into this late yesterday afternoon. So didn't have a lot of time to prepare a real uh, complex presentation for you. But I think that's a good thing because Danielle and I can uh, just kind of share from the heart and from our experience about. What we've been going through here at the League of Cities itself, who's actually been a cohort participant starting in 2017, developing our own internal race equity action plan to drive the work of this organization. But I'll also fill you in a bit on the cohort model that we've been working with Gare on. Any, I don't want to fill the cramp to any introductory things you want to say, Danielle, before I get a little busy. This is more your style, so I think okay. this is all going to work out very well. Okay, yeah. so, um, so here's a little bit of the history of what happened. Um, in about 2014, 2015, we had the increasing number of incidents around the country that were drawing attention. Uh, Trayvon Martin in Sanford, Florida, and then probably mainly the Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. And of course, we're the statewide association of all the city governments in the state. And so some of our cities, and especially our city managers, started to say to us, what are we all doing to think about that? What are we doing to prepare? Because that could have happened in our city. And had it happened in our city, we don't have a clue how we would have handled it. It would have been horrible. It would have been awful. Uh, you know, Peter's gone through everything they've gone through in Falcon Heights. I'm sure he can attest to how that is not an experience that any city council member or any staff wants to go through. And so we began to have some discussion about what do we need to be doing as a community of city officials. And um, in 2015, our City Managers Association wanted to use the occasion of their winter conference or their winter workshop to really delve into this topic. 
Now, moment of disclosure, how we got connected to GARE is that Julie Nelson, who is one of the, she's the president of the GARE side in the local government part, is actually, I kind of like to tongue in cheek say, she is my wife's first cousin once removed. <laughs> and so Julie had been coming to Minnesota to work with some of the larger jurisdictions like Minneapolis and St. Paul and the Metropolitan Council and Hennepin County. And we sort of reignited family relationships and friendships and Julie would stay with Terry and me when she was here. And so when the city managers wanted to do a workshop, I said, well, I know a great speaker. So we brought Julie in to do it. And that led to a request then from moving from a one day workshop to a bunch of our um, cities saying, would the league help us come together in a cohort model to delve into race equity analysis and work collectively? And the league said, yes, we would absolutely do that. And so in 20, beginning in 2016, we launched our first cohort model. Uh, part of the issues was, as Gordon just told you, GARE has only a limited amount of staff capacity, and it was even more limited then. And so they knew there were about 11 cities that were in it in, in the first year and a few state agencies, and they knew they couldn't do each of those individually. So we did it collectively, and we did training sessions that were held in community centers and other places where we had to pack 200 people in, but the, the different jurisdictions were working in teams. And our first um, 2016 cohort had 11 local government participants. There was Ramsey County and Minneapolis, and then beyond that, sort of a smattering of suburban communities around the metro core, some of which you might expect, like Brooklyn Park, and some of which would surprise you, like Woodbury, who felt that this was an issue they wanted to get into. And so we had that first year, and we had that first experience. It went really well. Uh, at about the same time, our board of directors decided to consider race equity as a topic that this institution, uh, the League of Cities, should get into on its own, kind of separate from just supporting the cohort participants. And so the board does a, uh, their own strategic planning retreat each fall in September, and they brought in um, Glenn Harris, who's the president uh, now of the Center for Social Inclusion, and ironically was born in Pipestone. We've talked about Pipestone a couple of times. His father was in the military and then stationed out there when he was born, so he spent the first two years of his life in Pipestone. And then about the same time, the National League of Cities, our partner organization in Washington, D.C., uh, was delving into race equity, and their relatively new executive director, Clarence Anthony, who is African American, brought this issue uh, with some concern about how it would be received to the National League of Cities. So we had Clarence come in and talk about that relationship, and it was a really a moment of transformation for our board of directors who meets in this room once a month in a square configuration. And um, I think the power was Glenn and Clarence not only talking about institutional issues around racism, but really sharing their experiences as African American men and what they, some of the things that they experienced in society, how they felt about their experience in leadership positions, some of the reactions they get. Uh, Clarence talked about how his bringing this um, priority to the National League of Cities was being received among different state leagues around the country. And like it often is, I think it was really an eye-opening moment for our board. Um, we kind of got started in this work through the advocacy of some folks who were really true believers in pushing this agenda, like Council Member Elizabeth Glidden from the city of Minneapolis. But as you can imagine, we have, we have council members and staff from all over the state, some small towns. And by the time the discussion was over, really to a person, they became very supportive of making this a major priority of the League of Cities. So in 2017, we held our second cohort model. Um, we had about 10 or 11 local jurisdictions. And then, as I said, the board said, if the league is going to do this, it needs to walk its talk. We need to do our own internal race equity work. And so we put together an internal race equity team that Danielle and I both serve on, along with about uh, 10 of our colleagues. We spent the last year developing our own race equity action plan. And just to um, just to slightly impress you how complex this work gets, it goes on for four pages like this. This is the, the, you know, the major sort of work that you do and why it gets so staff intensive. But really, we organized our work around three key results that we are looking for and where we thought of the League of Cities we could have influence on this agenda. Um, one, we related back to our core mission, which is that all cities are thriving, taking advantage of new opportunities and successfully meeting ongoing challenges. So we tried to make the link to say they can't really do that if they don't address racial inequity. And as a side note, I'll say I think one of the reasons this captures everybody's attention in this state is this idea that we have the largest or some of the very largest disparities in the country. I think that shocks people. I think people say, 
that's not who I think Minnesota is. That's not who I think Minnesota wants to be. Why is that happening and what can we do about it? Beyond some of the, you know, the incidents that happened like the Jamar Clark or Orlando Castile uh, shooting. So in that area, we have uh, tried to do a lot of work internally about getting our own staff to think about race equity, be sensitive in dealing with it, and also look at some of our HR practices so that eventually when you walk into this building, you will see a staff that looks more like the demographic cross-section of Minnesota. Our um, second major priority is that all Minnesotans are represented on boards, commissions, and committees that are involved in local government. We thought it's important that when people see their own city council, they see their own planning commission, they see their human rights commission, they see their parks commission. Again, it's not all just white faces up there. They see people that look like them regardless of where they are. And to that end, we want to do some work to make sure our board of directors is reflective of the demographics of the state. And also really challenging ourselves to think about things like our policy committees that set our legislative policy priorities. We've never really looked at any of those policy priorities through a race equity lens before, except when it was things that were really obvious, like, you know, um, um, cameras worn by police officers or some things like that, you know, maybe there was sort of a secondary thought about it, but we didn't really look at everything. And then the third is that our, our third goal is that all Minnesota citizens, Minnesotans should live in cities that have racial equity. And to that end, we're continuing our commitment to not only support future cohort models who do the whole GARE thing, that is somebody very accurately said is pretty intense, staff intense, but also making sure all Minnesota cities have access to the resources they need. Um, we're going to be putting together some materials and putting them online, but one of the things we know is that's really not going to be adequate. Uh, we have to figure out how we help our cities do the deep cultural change work that has to happen to really uh, delve into race equity and deal with it successfully. So somebody um, asked, is everybody what is, does this, you know, here maybe is great for cities of 20,000 and above, what about everybody else, which is the vast majority of cities in our state. And the executive director has challenged and tasked me with helping lead that discussion about what sort of support mechanisms do we need in place for the pipe zones of the world, or some of you know Delano uh, had to deal with an ugly racial incident and they've developed some things. So we're seeing what we can learn from them. And, and this year we're also going to be rolling out some work with smaller cities to, I think, develop models that are equally as um, impactful in their local governments, but maybe don't require quite the same level of staff commitment. So that's kind of where we're at, and I think I'm going to see what Danielle would like to add to this uh, at this point, and then I think we can open it up for questions. We can address some of the specific questions that you had or the issues yeah. report. Danielle? Well, I'm interested in what your questions are going to be. I'll add a couple of things. Um, that board workshop that Kevin referenced that happened in 2015, 16, is something that people still talk about around here, which is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, how often do you reference the workshop that you went to several years ago? Um, and I think the reason why is the influence and the, the benefit of having that buy-in from leadership continues to resonate. Um, and you see ripple effects of, uh, of that in what we're able to do as staffers on the ground level uh, because we do have that uh, charge from the board that this is going to be a priority for the organization. So I would really want, I would never want to underemphasize the value of having that buy-in both from our board and our executive director. Um, we were in a unique position in that as an, well, I guess it's not to some degree, it's unique. Uh, as a member organization, we wanted to focus internally on ourselves and making sure that our organization is walking the walk in terms of some of these issues. But we're also seen uh, and want to position ourselves as, as a resource with some authenticity for our members, which span the entire spectrum of communities in Minnesota. So we're really thinking about it sort of in a dual manner of what we need to be doing internally, basically at the same time as we're starting to think about what those resources will look like for our members. Um, and that's where uh, some of the value of the, uh, the GARE cohort um, comes in because there's a lot of cross-pollination and a lot of communication between the different entities that were participating in that model and now are aware that the league is, is working on these topics. And so we're always going to be uh, interested in what cities have to say about as Gordon mentioned the, the types of resources or refinement that's going to make it work as we scale this for uh, different sizes, but also just different uh, makeups of our communities um, as we move forward. 
think those were the highlights that I wanted to add. Right. Yeah. So um, I, what I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of flavor about what this work I think is going to look like inside the league, and then you may have questions about what some of our cities are starting to do. But um, we truly, we expanded our team moving into 2018. We're making sure every division and every department of the league is covered and will eventually have its own race equity action plan. Um, the first thing that we are doing is making sure all of our employees are on board. So once a month, we're hosting training sessions of about 25 to 30 people in this room. And I had the privilege of being the person who helped facilitate the first one. Um, to launch all this, we've, we've kind of been getting some momentum going around talking about it a little bit. Danielle is the editor of what we call our GRIT newsletter. Our team is called Generating Racial Inclusion Together, I think, is pretty close. Because love the government, love the good acronym, right? We yeah, love a good acronym. <laughs> so part of this, I think, the really important first step is just normalizing the conversation. And um, Gordon talked to you about that this morning, getting people comfortable with, hey, it's okay to talk about race. We really don't have to avoid it when we're together. And I have been delighted by the reaction that I've seen from just the employees around here. We started with a race equity um, launch where we invited people in for some ethnically diverse food and then let them go around, move in stations, and just ask questions. We have administered the gear sort of pre-survey to find out where people are at. And then we had the first um, training session. And you know, a lot of the training sessions revolves around things like, well, what's been your experience with race? One of the questions we ask is, you know, what teachers of color did you have while you were growing up? Or when did you first become aware of race? And people just kind of, all of a sudden the barriers drop and people just get fascinated by the discussion and are really pretty open-minded. Um, another thing, Gordon kept uh, referring to the race, the power of an illusion video that we show, in my opinion, very powerful in terms of the history of how race got defined in America, in terms of, you see a whole series of Supreme Court decisions dating back to the late 19th century and early 20s that defined race, and you just go, are you kidding me? This is absurd. You know, one person was white, somebody else wasn't white. There's a thing about if you were in Alabama, you were a person of color. If you went across the line into Georgia, you were a white person. Uh, if you came from one country, you were considered not white, and if you came from another country, you were considered white. And the privileges that were given to whiteness, and then it moves into a discussion about our, our national housing policy and how that very deliberately fomented um, the segregation, the residential segregation that we see even today, that then sort of leads into accumulation of wealth differential, that uh, people of color were uh, consigned to either rental housing or to lower income neighborhoods where property values didn't go up very much. In fact, maybe they went down where white people had an opportunity to move out to the burgeoning suburbs in the 50s and invest in property that came up in value, and now they have a lot more value. And I, it, it kind of goes to the question, the one, um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name, but you were asking here about how do you talk to people who maybe go, well, wait a minute, I'm white, but my family came over here too, and we had to work hard. And part of what you start to see out of that is, yes, that's true, you did, but you got to do it as a white person, and that has certain privileges in this society that were denied to people of color. And so... I think that part really becomes very powerful for people. And then also the power of being able to think about actionable things that you individually can start to do about that if you care and how you can be a part of an institution that's willing to address institutional and structural racism in society and start to dismantle it in a way that I think you can argue is really uh, better results and better outcomes for everyone. So here at the league, uh, so what's this going to look like on the ground at the league? Well, I think the two areas that we're going to really be making some progress in during 2018 is one that Danielle is involved in. She's part of the communication staff, and I think we're going to be trying to develop a comprehensive communication strategy that makes sure everything we do, whether it's our magazine or our website or our social media blogs or whatever it is, you see more reflection. You see more people of color. You see more coverage and normalizing of those kinds of issues. And the second area that I think we'll start to make some progress in this year is in our own HR policies. How do we think about the jobs that we recruit for here, the processes we use to find people, the job qualifications that you're expecting, you know, are, are they really relevant to the job or do they tend to have a uh, sort of a differential impact? But then I think moving into 2019 and beyond, you, we will hopefully start to get into areas that are a little bit more challenging to think about, but equally valuable. So as I mentioned, our legislative policies, 
Um, for example, we just weighed in on some of the reforms around the state pension systems. And I think that's good. I think what the state's doing great. But we didn't really stop to ask the question about, well, if we're going to advocate for that, how do those pension reforms have a differential impact on people of color? That might be a kind of a question we would want to look at. Or tax policy or anything else that we're advocating for. Um, one of the ones that really intrigues me, we're the insurance company, basically, for all the cities in the state except the three uh, first-class cities. And so really thinking about racial equity impacts in insurance, you know, how we settle claims to make sure that we don't settle claims differently with people of color than we do people, uh, white people. Even underwriting criteria, I think we kind of know in terms of um, homeowners insurance that there's been some issues around that, but for us, you know, maybe there's things about how we insure our members or certainly loss control training. You know, we, we started to do a lot of uh, implicit bias training for our police officers, but there's other kinds of areas that we can be looking at. So again, I think it's a combination of normalizing the discussion, getting people comfortable talking about it, and then giving people operational and tangible solutions. And um, one other interesting area we're looking at is we now own this whole block except for the White Castle. And we're working with the city of St. Paul to try to figure out how we redevelop the west end of this block down near Marion Street. Well, all of a sudden, we're starting to say, you know what? It's not all just about us. There's a neighborhood all around here. And shouldn't we maybe kind of be talking to that neighborhood about how they feel about this property? Uh, there used to be a funky old car dealership there, and we tore that down. And since then, they've had the um, privilege of looking at our sort of empty lot down there with a bunch of ugly rocks all over it. And someday we're going to put a building up probably and do something with it. So um, we started to say, you know, uh, we need to think about the racial implications. This is, you know, primarily a community of color that we're located in in Frogtown. So we want to, again, walk our talk in that area. Daniel, um, one of my sparks in your mind. Yeah, I think that emphasis on community engagement is one of those places where uh, you'll see uh, race equity intersecting with everything all the time. Um, so you see that in the environmental work as well. One highlight that is super obvious to me was the Parks and Rec workshop we did last year where they started talking about the community engagement process that I believe the city of St. Paul went through um, to learn about how the community was really uh, perceiving using or not using the park spaces. Um, so the, the community engagement is, is a new, maybe a newer part of the toolkit for the league itself as an organization in this building. Um, it's going to come a little more naturally to some of the cities out there who are, of course, doing that direct service to uh, residents. Um, so you'll you'll see some similarities between uh, the, the tools that are involved in some of that race equity analysis and some of the tools that communities are using effectively to make sure that um, they're really hearing from residents about what they're going to be needing in terms of, you know, if you'll be developing a, a living street project or something like that. Um, some of the steps will sound similar, and that certainly goes back to Gordon's point about how when you start addressing race equity uh, disparities, you're going to start creating benefits for everyone um, as well. Okay. So why don't we open it up? Questions or comments? Reactions? Yeah, so. Well, I think as I talk with cities, I hear and I think a lot about who, I think uh, about task forces and city commissions, um, and it, it, I think there is often a lack of intentionality because the smaller the city, you're just happy to get someone to serve uh, uh, you know, on your commission. And recruitment, yeah, I think is you know, not infrequently, I think, on, on a, like an environment commission. It's sort of easy to go to those people who've traditionally been uh, engaged and you sort of know them and they've been comfortable walking into city hall and and um, and I know there's some I'm thinking I think it's the Human Rights Commission has sort of a how to look at your city commissions and and uh, ways as if more intentional think about who's represented and how you're reaching out and who serves and who's appointed and so so that's an issue that sort of comes to my mind I hear hear about occasionally right yeah yeah we want to um... Also, part of our work is going to be entering partnerships with groups like, I don't know if you're aware of, Nexus Community Partners that actually train oh. people of color to get prepared to be meaningful and impactful involvement with local task forces and commissions and city councils. You know, kind of figuring out, in some sense, those kind of organizations have traditionally had an antagonistic relationship with government and have come from more of an adversarial community organizing model. And most of them have said, we're not giving that up. That's part of our 
are bailiwick, but they also might be willing to collaborate with governments that they think are being authentic and genuine. I don't know what you're finding in, in St. Louis Park, you know, doing some work with groups like that. We're also in conversation with Voices for Racial Justice, I think, is a group that's done a lot of uh, important work, both in the Twin Cities and also in Greater Minnesota, Worthington and Duluth, and we're kind of trying to foster that relationship as well. Yeah. Have you had pushback from community to, um, I'm thinking about this because we had some pushback um, where someone's saying, well, this really isn't a priority to us. We don't care about this work thing, so we don't really need this kind of work thing. How have you addressed that if you've encountered that? Um, we haven't had anybody come in and vocalize it in a public space. I've heard behind the scenes that there are communities who have said, this isn't for us, we're largely a white community, so why would we make it a priority? And I think I have a good response to this. I think you're as close as the next incident happening in your community that can make it your issue, like I think Delano learned, and I think Dinah learned, and some others. But at the same time, um, we have to, we're a member-based organization, so we're respectful that people will choose to attach or not attach to this work as they think is meaningful for their city. And that's why we want to keep normalizing the discussion and try to make everybody at least think about what, what should they be doing. And there's even been a, a little bit of rumbling from some quarters about why is this a priority of the league versus other things the league might be doing that's more important, or even the whole thing about, well, is the league um, joining on to sort of a liberal progressive agenda here? And, you know, is that going to compromise the nonpartisan nature of the league that we highly value and use? So, yeah, but we, I think the answer to that is, really what Gordon was talking about is you really focus on the outcomes piece, you know, and, and try to get away from this idea that it's a political agenda. I think realistically, you know, there's, there's politics and everything, and that would be just naive to think you can't do that. But I think if you present people with this disparity and outcomes piece, it's kind of like, okay, here it is, people. What do you want to do about this? And if today is the day that you want to get on board and join a Garrett cohort or use League Resources, we're going to be here for you. If the timing isn't right for your community, we just have to respect that. So kind of similar, that reminds me of Green Steps approach. Mm -hmm. Look, exactly. These tools and resources yeah. are available. It's your choice. Yeah. In the long run, it's going to make your community so much better for all these great reasons. But you know, you don't have to. It's voluntary. And we have had um, a lot of the city managers say that the league's sort of endorsement of this has been so important politically in their communities to give it legs that it would have been really hard. Um, one of the cohorts this year, the city manager walked in and she said, had the league not been endorsing this, we wouldn't be here. But it's easier when they can point, you know, once they get a, a challenge from citizen or others, they can point to, well, our statewide association, the League of Minnesota Cities is saying this is important stuff we need, need to be dealing with. So it helps. Hi, I think I missed the introductions. I'm Michelle Shaw. I am the assistant in Minneapolis and just here learn what's happening at the Mount Pritvar Neighborhood Association too. Which neighborhood? Uh, Wade Park. Okay, welcome. So I'm just curious, how did we, um, how did we get people of color to even know opportunities exist for enrollment? Within city government? Within city government, different environmental opportunities, I guess, within the city. Um, I didn't even know a lot of things existed up a couple months, a couple months ago. <laughs> Um, How did you learn about the opportunity? Out of curiosity. Um, through involvement in a nonprofit. Okay. So I was assigned to look up. Yeah. We do, if I may. Where are you from? I didn't hear. Um, clean energy resource teams are third. Um, in our clean energy work, we have found that um, with farmers, for example, instead of expecting them to come to us, we need to learn to go to them. And so we've partnered with different organizations that work with farmers and have credibility with farmers. And I say, I think there's some parallels. And then we are going to these meetings that are already taking place. Um, and then that's how they learn about us. So I'm guessing that might be an effective strategy. Um, going into the community. Right. And with trusted partners, um, meetings that are already taking place with organizations that have credibility, the people you're wanting to work with, say hi. I'm here today visiting your meeting to let you know about these opportunities. We have these things going on. We'd like to get your input on this, et cetera, um, instead of they need to come to us. Because they may never know you're there. And they're busy <laughs> people and they have their own stuff going on. And, yeah. And how is the police doing that? Well, 
Well, the league itself, we are a member-based association, so our relevant constituency group is are the city governments themselves, and we, for the most part, would not try to reach out to citizens beyond our city members. We would encourage our city members to do that. We're inclined to do this work. Now, in the case of Minneapolis, like you said you're on the Wake Park Neighborhood Council. Yeah. So, yeah, I actually, I live in downtown. I'm on the Downtown Minneapolis Neighborhood Association, and they actually have a, Minneapolis has a pretty good organization through their Neighborhood and Community Relations Department and their commission, where I would think your association would want to connect through that. They are very, very proactive in reaching out and getting a diversity of people to volunteer and be appointed to city boards and commissions and neighborhood activities. What did you call, what did you say about um, it is the, the department is I think called the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department NCR. It's just the department of the city under the city coordinator's office, and then they have a commission called the Neighborhood Community Engagement Commission. And every spring they have this Community Connections Conference. I just went to it in February over at the convention center where all the neighborhood associations kind of connect, and plug into all of those things. So your staff, you should have a staff person that you work with at NCR, and they would be happy, I'm sure, to fill you in on how you get involved. I think many of the responses that, oh, oh, I was just going to add a couple of things. One thing is that this is about, when you talk about communities of color and historically been underrepresented, you're talking about a long term trust. There is not a government agency for communities of color who have not intentionally either, you know, anywhere from laws to killing communities of color. So it's, it's about long term trust. Also, I would say, why do you want folks at the table? So if if folks are at the table, do they truly have um, ways to give input for outcomes? Because if you're asking um, underheard communities to come in, but yet they're going to share their voice, you're just perpetuating white supremacy all over again. So ask yourself very, like, legitimately, why? Why do we want folks of color participate? And then look at your structure. What, uh, I mean, are we using Robert rules for meetings? Why are they help for? Like, you need to ask yourself some very legit questions even before you do that. So I tell folks all the time, before I invite people to my house, I clean up my house. So clean up your house before you start wanting to invite folks in. But know that when you start talking about how are they going to come to us, you're already creating a place of, it's not, it's just welcoming, but not true inclusion. So you need, I think Minnesotans do welcoming fine, we don't do inclusion well. So how do we redistribute those resources? How do we look at our process, especially as neighborhood associations? Because it's most of them in Minneapolis, primarily white. Um, and so how are we rethinking the way we do things, looking at our bylaws? So it's more than just, so yes, getting partners going to folks, but that's long-term trust. Um, and once you break community trust, you probably won't get it back, they'll tread like late. So that's just my little piece. No, that's excellent. Oh. I think it goes to show kind of the cultural nuance side of this work, and that's what we kind of try to clearly say to some of our members. It's like, we can't give you a checklist of how to do race equity. <laughs> You're never going to get there if that's their approach. you say, you got to change the culture, and as you said, be very intentional about what you're doing. Um, when I met with Voices for Racial Justice, you know, they kind of talked to us about, I just said, what's your experience with city government? Well, what do you think? And the loudest complaint I heard is city officials showing up, pretending to listen, making a big scene, and then leaving, and they said, and nothing ever changes, not one thing changes, so why would we even come to the second meeting? Um, can you talk a bit about, I was hoping some, some of the cities who have gone through the process uh, would be here, and I know Tim was back kind of I know you didn't, um, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but just have things to say, I know you won't. So I appreciate that. Um, but you want to talk about some of the things that, um, cities have learned going through this um, and, and how they're addressing that and if you have some to stand on what was Gosh, highlight, low light, all, all of the above. Um, you know, it tends to be a pretty candid discussion when you're there. So um, I know we've had some really rich conversations with other uh, entities that at first you think, well, what is the league as a, as a member organization going to learn from, say, this county, but oftentimes it's great to see how uh, the different groups 
you know, maybe we're all working on a race equity action plan, but that's going to look very different for every community. Um, gosh, I mean, I would just be naming interesting highlights. We've, uh, one in particular was a county that actually established a pilot project where they went to their frontline staff, uh, folks that would probably be lower on the hierarchy level um, within their, their government and really empowered some of those um, up and coming leaders to be thinking about pilot projects related to the race equity work and had a really um, found it to be a springboard for, for additional work. It really created a lot of momentum and it was starting in a place that I think we would probably think is a little unconventional. You know, you think about like top down leadership and which is of course very important, but uh, those pilot projects ended up being um, creating a big impact within that organization and that's something that we took away from that. I don't want to say it and be wrong. Okay. <laughs> I think so. Probably they were going to okay. back to the right. cohort. Um, so, uh, surprise, pleasant surprise learning experience for us. Um, it, would that work in every city? I don't know. It worked for them. So, there's a lot of individualization that goes into that process based on the structure you have. So, it's really great to hear about those experiences. Um, one challenge that I recall hearing uh, was a city that had. Uh, 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 what do they call it? They have a, a diversity commission that was happening sort of simultaneously as their GARE cohort was proceeding with the race equity action plan. And because they had a mix of elected and appointed officials, you know, your elected officials may have day jobs, so they can't go to a meeting with your appointed officials in the city. They had a lot of challenges integrating those processes so that they're not duplicating their work and also finding mm -hmm. those times when it's so important to come together and just like talk it out and figure out where you're at and where you need to be going. Um, so never underestimate the, the challenge of a, a, a logistical issue, but at the same time, all of those logistical issues can be overcome with uh, thoughtful things. So, so that would be a high and a low that I guess I would share through broad. Yeah, I think um, the reality is just time-wise at this point is the 2016 cohort is kind of moving into implementation now. The rest of us are just truly, it takes a year to get to that plan. A year of hard work. St. Louis Park has certainly been a leader. So, look, uh, well, I, I'm sorry, I haven't met you before. I'm glad you're here. But what's your name again? Alicia Sojourner. Alicia, great, because I know you're going to be on our panel in St. Cloud in, 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 on uh, June. Yeah. So, yeah, that'll be great. So, I certainly looked at them as, you know, a leader. Um, some, a few cities have done some really tangible things like the Pathways to Policing program, I think, that you guys have done in conjunction with Bloomington and some of the other suburban communities in Hennepin County. Um, a lot of work, I think, has started to happen in the HR area because that's sort of an obvious kind of one. But one of the things that we heard from a lot of our 2016 cohorts is they had their plan, they started down their 2017 path, and they ran into some obstacles for a bunch of reasons, and they had to back up and do the cultural work. You know, they started trying to implement things and they hadn't really prepared everybody yet. And so they had to get their elected officials and their staff um, on board. So that's the main thing we've heard so far. And this is really a, a work in progress. And I just wanted to, well, Danielle's comments really triggered something for me also to know about this work is that it does upend, I think, the decision making structure of an organization. To be effective, you have to go from a hierarchical system to a much flatter and even bottom up system. And I tend to think that younger people just resonate to this stuff easier and they kind of get this community engagement part. And I don't mean to over flatter my millennial friends, but I love them. <laughs> you know, I'm an old style boomer here, you know, who grew up when the structure of government was a little bit more hierarchical, maybe democratic, but hierarchical and how it did things. And if you try to manage it that way, it sort of undermines it. You have to empower things like the one county did where people have a little more freedom to do things at the, at the grassroots level. And yet you got to hold the whole system accountable. So it's a tension. There's a lot of tension that this works. There's also a tension I find among a competing agenda that says, this is urgent. We got to hurry up. We got to really get things moving because people have been waiting too long. And then it's, slow down. You're going too fast. You haven't consulted community and everybody who's engaged yet. So I'm always, oh, I need to be on that tension. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so could you speak a little bit more if there is a city who's not a part of this yet if they want to get involved, what are their next steps? And a little bit more on the time commitment or requirements they need to commit in order to go through. 
Um, we will probably be doing two things. I think we will be finding out if we have enough cities to form a cohort in 2019. Uh, we have five signups for 2018, so it's definitely on the downward project, uh, trajectory in terms of the number of cities, and I don't know if that's a longer-term trend. We've kind of mined the group of communities, but we will definitely consider that and add another cohort next year. And then, as I said, we're really challenged to figure out how do we put together something meaningful for other cities that want to get involved. So there's um, two of us on staff who really have been given the responsibility and time within our job descriptions to be the point persons on this, and that's me and Rachel Walker, our policy manager, who works for me and with me. People like Danielle are doing this as part of their uh, job responsibilities, both within their department and across the organization internally, but not quite as much the external work. Although, one of the things we'll probably be figuring out is if people like Danielle and others on our team can uh, become facilitators for city-based or community-based conversations, because I think that's one of the things, you know, if, if a city doesn't join GARE, they're going to have to have somebody come in and do that basic training with them. If you don't get the basic training up front, you start to get the framework in place, it's not going to be great. I'm going to bring it back, Bill, because I'll come back to you. Um, and, you know, we've, we've been grappling with, you know, how does this fit in to create the cities in a meaningful way. Um, and I, in my conversation with Alicia, one thing that sort of stuck out to me is, you know, thinking about are you being reactionary or are you being kind of preventative? Um, in Grace the Cities, the way it's designed, it's, it's kind of reactionary. What did you do? Report your best practices you've already done. Um, so, how can we start looking forward? Um, as, as a program and think about how we can how we can you know be more preventative and, and um, to be prepared for things and, and still fit it into the into the program in a way that makes sense and, and is meaningful. Um, so I encourage you all to think about that as, as you participate in this program. If you are thinking about you know when you are you know going through these best practices or you're doing something related in your city you can kind of try to think through this lens, participate in care as a possibility. Um, for your community um, and, and get involved in kind of, you know, environmental impact has tremendous environmental justice implications um, and uh, we have to be kind of aware of that and we have to start acknowledging sort of what's in our face uh, and, and being about that and come back in, in a way that makes it better for everybody because, you know, you don't, you're not achieving your quality of life goals if um, we're in the community. So um, I just want to kind of bring it back to that. That way, uh, let you all know that this is something that we're thinking about and trying to make that way to bring, bring it into the program. You know, I'm sort of follow on that. I, I'm just sort of sort of thinking about the um, the sort of the wasted sort of the wasted resource, the opportunistic side of this. And and you know, if we go back, think back. Um, you know, 50 years ago, post-war, you know, the sort of the talent of women was was not really appreciated and you had this very uh, concrete uh, limited role for women coming into this uh, this burgeoning workforce in America uh, or uh, thinking about uh, sort of the so so I'm just sort of thinking about how, what a waste it is to not to be looking out to all these elements in your community and I was, and I was actually thinking about work years ago in the uh, neighborhood association um, uh, uh, in Minneapolis, where we had issues of sort of road, railroad crossing, sort of um, um, uh, issues of, of safety and speeding, and uh, in sort of reaching out and sort of figuring out how can we work on this issue, issue um, there was a sort of a mid-rise um, uh, uh, housing for people with limited mobility, and in talking with people in wheelchairs trying to get across these uh, uh, credit railroad crossings, we we had just a tremendous outpouring of work and sort of data gathering and lobbying by people in wheelchairs. And we ended up actually taking on the railroads in this neighborhood and, and very effectively imp materially improving the quality of road sidewalks and especially railroad crossings for all. And it was like, wow, what an incredible wasted resource we had people thinking that people in wheelchairs would not be a, an effective community participant to make the neighborhood better for all. So I think when we think of race issues and uh, people of color, it's like there's this incredible opportunity and that's, and we, in sustainability environmental stuff, we think about the opportunities of using you know, stormwater and using energy better, but 
it's like we're just talking about people here. Danielle, I was just wondering um, if you had pilot projects, some of the examples of those. Um, you... Off the top of my head, I don't think I do. I can look into that and get back to you. Any other thoughts? Okay. Um, thank you guys for you know, short notice. Thanks for having us. It's fun to come and share it. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I appreciate the conversation. Everybody asked some questions. And, and um, thank you guys. Yeah. Uh, so I hope that this is something that we carry on. Um, from today, we will, we will um, be looking into doing that. Um, so it's, it's, you always have to start somewhere, um, and so we'll look at ways to better uh, include this in our program um, as we as we look to improve that. Uh, so that kind of concludes our April workshop. May will be our last workshop of the year. We're not doing one in June this year, but there will be the um, League of Minnesota City Conference in St. Cloud, um, which will have a number of kind of pre-workshop events or pre-conference events um, as well as a number of workshops throughout the conference that will be focused on Green Coast City, which is great. Um, I want to thank Siemens for sponsoring us. Uh, we'll be doing pedestrian plans and place making um, next time. And you know that's that's an opportunity for engagement and, and having real engagement because that is something that really uh, impacts the people who live, the people who come to, to the spaces that you want to create um, for people. So uh, with that, I don't think I have anything else. Thank you all, and yeah, hopefully spring is on its way. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Abby. Thank you.